The wolf feels like it's getting more and more dangerous. It, that's great news for your portfolio if you own a defense contractor, though. This whole group roared after Russia invaded Ukraine. Uh, but then it took a breather, pulling back substantially right up until the Hamas horrific attack on Israel. Now they're on fire again, especially because the situation in Gaza looks like it could spiral. Which brings me to Lockheed Martin, a stock that's up more than 12 percent versus where it was trading at the close of October 6th for the attack in Israel. Doesn't hurt that uh, Lockheed reported a very solid quarter October 17th. Well, they didn't raise their forecast, so Wall Street didn't care. I think this is a great moment for Lockheed, and I think as we get closer to Veterans Day, it's worth remembering this company is one of America's top employers of veterans. Last year, 30 percent of their new hires were former service members, and they were ranked number 10 in Forbes 2023 list of America's best employers for veterans, and I salute them for that. Let's take a close look with Jim Tankley. He's the chairman, president, and CEO of Lockheed Martin, an Air Force veteran himself. He used to fly a Lockheed C-141B star lifter. Mr. Tankley, welcome back to Man Body. Good evening, Jim. Great to be with you. Thank you for coming on, Jim. Yeah, Jim, it's a confusing time because we don't understand about the budget. We know that we need Lockheed Martin more than ever. But we, I guess what many of us uh, commonsensically are trying to figure out is why shouldn't uh, Congress be actually spending a huge amount of money in defense, given the fact that everything's kind of changed in the last year, and therefore uh, get a sense that Lockheed Martin should be getting much more money from the government to do what it has to do? Well, Jim, the, uh, the nature and the size of the defense budget, that is a policy decision for the government, Congress, and the administration to make. Whatever the budget is, we're going to do whatever we can to advance deterrence and drive capability through to our armed forces to help prevent future armed conflict, especially anything that might involve the United States itself. Okay. So tell me how it does work. You have hired so many veterans. You've probably got you go into a room with the people who work at your company. I bet you a lot of them say, I wish we should were doing this. I wish we were doing that. We should be doing this. Are you yourself, because you are a, a vet, offering advice to people that maybe perhaps the kind of war that we might have to fight is different from the kind that maybe their parents fought? It's going to be vastly different, Jim. And what we're trying to do at our company is be a bit of a pathfinder to drive 21st century digital technologies into our armed forces and national defense really to convince any potential adversary that it really isn't worth taking a measure, an attack, any kind of effort, an armed conflict against the United States or our allies. But we really do have to bring and marshal, if you will, all of American industry together to work on this. We've got alliances with NVIDIA, Microsoft, Intel, uh, and others to actually bring that digital technology more quickly into the defense enterprise. because. We want to prevent a future war because if it happens, it'll be devastating and it will be very different. But Jim, wouldn't some potential adversary say, you know what, they have knocked their arsenal down to, uh, to help Ukraine and then further down to help Israel. And the democracy arsenal is just too close to being empty for America to feel safe. Uh, I don't believe we're in a position where we're in an unsafe position, Jim. But what I do want to try to drive into the defense production system is using the C. Taleb's view of anti-fragility. Let's take out the fragility. Let's allow ourselves the room and the resources to scale quickly if we need to and increase production. That in and itself will be a deterrent to a future conflict potentially if the arsenal of democracy really gets strengthened and the fragility is taken out. What would happen if someone said to you in the government, you know what, Jim, you got to double the number of F F-35s that you're making right now because it's such a great plane. Capable of doing it? Well, we're capable of doing it with investment among our government, our company, and our suppliers. It would take a few years to pull that together. Uh, but we were asked, actually, uh, a couple of years ago to double the production of some of the systems that have been so effective in Ukraine and uh, in, in other uh, arenas in the world, including the Patriot missile. And we are in the process of raising that by about 60 percent. Oh, right that's now good. OK, I did not know that. It's now, doable. now, Jim, uh, uh, there's kind of a, this feeling that there's a low tech war that can that, that the bad guys do. I mean, look, we have drones. We have terrific technology. But the low tech governments seem to be able to project power with very inexpensive drones that seem to be able to be more efficient than we thought. What can we do to make it so that they can't hurt our service people? Well, we want to bring, again, more advanced technologies against these basic kinds of threats. And so there are approaches like using microwave, using mm -hmm. lasers, using electronic warfare to jam and defeat these kinds of, you know, small, relatively cheap drones. 
and we'll want to go ahead and, and develop our own, but develop our own drones that are much more survivable, much more controllable, and uh, much more uh, resilient, if you will, uh, to counter those kinds of efforts. So we want to be on offense and defense and use the latest technology to actually make that happen. Fantastic. Now, where are you these days? Is Veterans Day coming up on uh, the desire for others to share your predilection to hire people who work in, uh, who served, given how good I know you've told me multiple times they do at the job? Well, we are voting with our feet on veterans. We have about 20 percent of our employees are veterans, 24,000 in Lockheed Martin. We hired about 3,600 last year. We got 34 open jobs that we're recruiting for right now this year. And so I'd encourage any veteran or anyone that knows a veteran that's listening to this program tonight, let them know about our company and our sector. We welcome them to come join us. And what do veterans bring to your company that maybe people who didn't serve uh, don't know as much about? Well, what, what you bring is, uh, and you can kind of see it in the background there, you get a lot of responsibility at a young age. You have to lead. You don't get to command people. You got to lead people, some of whom might be more experienced, older than you. Uh, but if you learn those skills about responsibility, leadership by example, when you're in your 20s, you can actually take those forward your whole career. And the mission dedication that you have, whether it's Lockheed Martin or any other company, you get a veteran on your team, they're going to be committed. That's our experience. And when you're talking to an Intel or to an NVIDIA or any of the software companies, doesn't it help to have someone in the room who says, look, this is what this would do for me if I were commanding people overseas? Yeah, absolutely it does. And, and actually, many of those companies have uh, veterans themselves as part of their teams. Uh, we were just at Google yesterday, uh, and there was six people in the room. I'd say three or four of them had actual veteran military experience. So we're out there and we want to work together, tech industry, telecom, uh, in, uh, the intels and chip manufacturers of the world. We want to work together to drive this national defense forward and really try to prevent these conflicts from happening. One last question. You can help me to uh, figure this out. I, look, when I listen to the president of Ukraine, I think he makes a valid case he needs more weapons. I, when I listen to uh, the premier of Israel, I mean, I, you know, when you listen to Netanyahu, he wants more weapons. Uh, but these are political decisions for you, aren't they? I mean, these are not decisions where you can go and say, you know what, I think we could really help Ukraine with long-range missiles. Because you have a great assembly of missiles, and that's what everybody wants. You are not able to advocate, right? I mean, you are able to say, look, our missiles can do this. But you're not in, in there saying, listen, if you gave them these missiles, they could take, uh, they could take Crimea. That's not your job. A absolutely right, Jim. We don't get involved in policy. That's not our role in industry to do that. But our role is to provide information on what capabilities we have, what we can do in cooperating with allies to make those capabilities better. And we provide that information to government officials, and then they decide who, what, when, and where, and how uh, any of our products get delivered to uh, overseas countries. And are they asking the questions? I mean, sometimes I feel like, wow, we just learned that we're going to send some certain kind of missile. I said, well, why weren't we sending that before? I'm always trying confused about what we give Ukraine and what we give Israel versus what they want. And I think a lot of that is because they're pretty secretive about it. We don't know what's going to be next. Well, our government officials that work with industry directly, especially at the leadership level, we have a great rapport with them and all the way through the ranks, because information sharing and capability understanding is really important for both sides. That exchange is happening. The political decisions, the deployment decisions, the selection of what weapons go to what country, again, all in government, Jim. Well, look, I'm glad that I needed to understand that myself, honestly, because sometimes I get mad when somebody's not getting what I think of their allies and they're not getting the help we need. But you always tell us the straight story. That's Jim Takeley, Chairman, President, and CEO of Lockheed Martin. Jim, uh, uh, thank you for serving, and thank everyone at your company for serving as we approach Veterans Day. But every day should be Veterans Day. Thank you, sir. Good night, Jim. Thank you. May I find back after the break? Coming up, has a so-called regime change at the Fed given stocks room to run? Kramer goes off the charts to get a read on the S&P and more next. Don't miss a second of Mad Money. Follow at Jim Kramer on Twitter. Have a question? Tweet Kramer. Hashtag Mad Tweets. Send Jim an email to madmoney at CNBC.com or give us a call at 1-800-743-CNBC. Miss something? 
Head to madmoney.cnbc.com.